I'm going to talk about biodiversity, uh, and I'm going to focus on that. And I suppose I'll tell you a bit about what it is. I think you largely know what it is. I'm going to tell you what state we're in. I'm going to tell you what state I think we're going to be in. I suppose I'm going to tell you a lot about why it matters and why should we care about biodiversity uh, other than other environmental matters. And then I'll talk about some of the things that if we do nothing, where we'll be, and if we do something, where are the big opportunities? Um, I'm actually a professor of mathematics as well as a professor of ecology at the University of Queensland. And um, what I'm going to talk a bit about is the role of economics and economic thinking. And so a lot of my research group, which is probably the biggest conservation research group in the world, has made its name in the world's biggest journals by talking about the interface of economics and biodiversity conservation. And we take a return on investment approach, a business-like approach, to how do you get biodiversity saved. In fact, I have a document that the ACF uh, organised and, and, and publishes and distributes called The Business of Biodiversity. That document I wrote 10 years ago was about how do you get the best bang for your buck in spending money. And those things are now, those ideas have now gone global. So the Eureka Prize we won on Tuesday night last week was for software that basically designs the world's marine and terrestrial reserve systems. It's probably going to affect 10 to 20 per cent of the world's surface area in the next 50 years. It was used to redesign the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. It's actually building the marine park system all the way out to 320 kilometres in Australia, all the Commonwealth waters, which is an area the size of Australia, and it's being used in 100 countries from California to the United Kingdom to actually build everybody's marine reserve system. That's was one half of one of my PhD students, uh, one of my, my PhD students' thesis, 15 years ago. Um, so that's what that's the way we think. And so that what I what I will try and focus my advice on is where are the critical points on the assumption that in some sense what can people do above and beyond what government does. And I'll tell you all the things that government can't do for various levels of incompetence from government and how they don't get that approach. And therefore, where are those little lever points? I mean, you don't have uh, billions of dollars or $10 billion to buy back water. Uh, but where are the lever points where uh, environmental um, funds can be put to get the best biodiversity outcome? And that's what I'm going to try and focus on. Um, how is Australia's biodiversity? We, by any measure, have the worst uh, mammal extinctions in the world. Most of you would know almost 10% of all our mammals are extinct. That blows every other continent out of the water. It is a disaster. And they're all the medium-sized things. And most people know that story. Most people don't know the story that John Wynarski was t telling us at the Intercol conference, the biggest international ecology conference, which was held in Brisbane last week, that those medium-sized mammals that went extinct, these are the bandicoots, bilbies, quolls, potteroos, uh, uh, in southern Australia, and most of them went extinct 50 to 150 years ago, in northern Australia, the same thing is happening. There is a mass crash in mammal uh, populations as we speak. And that's largely not because of clearing, because most of northern Australia has not been cleared, but it's clearing in ways through grazing and fire, poor fire management. And so we're in the middle of a second wave of mass mammal extinction, which is as embarrassing as our first wave of mass mammal extinction. And we're probably at the start of a large bird extinction event in Australia. Most of our bird extinctions, again, around 20 species, were all on little islands, Lord Howe Island, Norfolk Island, very few mainland extinctions, one definitively paradise parrot, and there's discussions about others. That's not a bad record. And they were because we arrived on a little island with rats and pigs and goats and stuff like that. But now, in a lot of Australia, the seed eaters particularly are disappearing again, probably through overgrazing and poor fire management. So some of the big issues, I mean, David talked about land clearing, some of the big wins have happened. We have more or less stopped land clearing through the campaigns of many, many people, including the people sitting here. I was very proud when Peter Beattie said land clearing will end in Queensland. He was waving a letter written by myself and Barry Trail, signed by 500 people, and he said, the scientists have said that land clearing is complete insanity, and they stopped it. That stopped 50,000 uh, 50 
about 50 million hectares from being destroyed. So if I have a, have a carbon credit, it's about a couple of billion uh, tonnes of carbon that I have to share with all the other people on that campaign. But that was an enormous win. They were the big things, the stopping the doing stupid things. And probably the stupid thing we're down, doing most of now is overgrazing. It's a hard one to stop because you can throw people in front of bulldozers and the bulldozer story is fairly clear. You knock down native vegetation, you wipe out biodiversity. The logging old forest is fairly clear. The damming large rivers is fairly clear. But how do you get the message to the Australian people that overgrazing over the centre and the north, which plays out over a very long time period, is going to cause the same wave of extinction as those land clearing events have already caused in the past. Um, the reason why I have, since the age of 12, devoted my entire life to saving biodiversity when I started becoming a bird watcher is uh, largely because I like it. That's it. And as time's progressed, other environmental issues. Biodiversity has never been the top of the pile. And most recently, in the last 10 years, it's water and now it's climate change. And most people are concerned more about them than biodiversity. The general public still don't really care that much about biodiversity. And my argument, why do I persist with biodiversity in the face of other issues like water problems and climate change problems, is twofold. One, if we mess up the water and we mess up the climate, people die and they suffer. And I think they're fairly good at stopping that. Nobody wants to die, nobody wants to suffer. We are basically self-interested organisms. We will deal with these things, we will suffer a lot of pain, and we have trouble dealing with the time lags that David mentioned, the thousand-year time lags. Nobody really fathoms a thousand years. But biodiversity, if we lose half of it in the planet, nobody's going to die. There's lots of people who will say they do. That I dis disagree with those arguments. The ecosystem functions of the planet can lose probably 50, maybe 80% of all the species in the world, and I doubt it will change at all agricultural productivity, and it won't really change the person on the street's life. So how do you engage people on that issue? And this is my argument. While climate change may take one or 2,000 years to turn around, if we wipe out half the species on the planet, that will take us two million years to turn around. So this is a long time scale effect. Two million years at a thousand times, or as I say when I'm talking to public groups, that's basically 40,000 times as many people as have ever lived will suffer the consequences of half the species of the planet going. 40,000 times as many people as have ever lived will suffer those consequences. So I'm thinking about... In a thousand years' time, they'll be annoyed with us for burning all the fossil fuels and making the place a warm and sticky place. But they'll deal with it and they'll move on. But then, for a thousand times that number of people, for a thousand, thousand years, for a million years, they will complain about this generation of people or this group of generations of people that we're sitting in now from 1800 to 2200 for wiping out half the species on the planet and they, have, they can't do anything about it. That's a thousand times the impact. And if only 10% of people in the world care about biodiversity, it's still a hundred times the impact. And that's my argument. You can buy it or not. And we know that nobody particularly likes these long time scale arguments. I'm trying to think about what are people going to think about in the far, far distant future. So, probably the biggest issue on biodiversity is twofold. One is uh, how do we get governments to spend their money wisely and how do we get them to do a better job? But maybe the second thing I'd like to talk about is how do we engage the general public better? How do we get more people interested in biodiversity if we're interested in biodiversity? Because at the moment it's probably about 5% of the people out there who really would care that, you know, instead of seeing three lorikeets in the suburbs of Melbourne, you can only have one. Instead of seeing seven species of honey eater, you can have two. Okay? I think only about 5% of this country care about that. That's a major problem if you really want to lobby for biodiversity. In North America, there are 20 million bird watchers. The RSPB is, I think, somebody correct me, the third or fourth biggest landowner in the entire United Kingdom and has over 50 reserves. And they have a membership 
which, although the United Kingdom has a bigger population, they have tenfold the membership we have in our natural history groups in the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. So basically, by any measure, Australians just don't know about biodiversity. We're sitting in a place where we can see 10 species of parrot fly over our head every day, and most of us don't know the names of any of them, other than they might know they're a parrot. And so arguably, probably the, the biggest problem we face is getting everybody engaged in biodiversity, and we have to think of better ways of doing that, because at the moment, they're not particularly engaged. And I would say education at the lower school levels has improved in the environment, but people just that the people who remain committed fundamentally to conservation of biodiversity are people who actually know how to identify something. In the last 50 years, there's been the, the, the core of the green groups have been driven by people who just love nature for nature's sake and they delight in its diversity and they just love it. They want to see it and they mourn the loss of every species. So somehow we've got to get that group of people up from 5% up to 20% and then they become a powerful lobby group and that's absolutely critical. I play lots of computer games, believe it or not. I waste large fractions of my life staring at a screen playing computer games. That is one of my pastimes to, before I can go to sleep at 2am in the morning. But that is the way to engage people. If, if I was wanting to... I have a friend in Durham, uh, uh, sorry, in Canterbury in Kent who is about to build a computer game based on an old game called Sim Safari where you have a safari park in Africa, you have all these species, it has lovely animation, you can buy species and sell species, you run a... some of your children or you even or may have played this game, you can hire staff, you can build tourism infrastructure, you make money. It's basically a game of economics and population ecology and fires happen and there's locusts and the lions eat the zebras and so forth. And this game, it's 10 years old, had remarkable graphics and many, many people got to play with nature and it's a nice strategic game, it develops their minds as well. That's the kind of game we need here. My lab produced a game called Biodiversity, called B-U-Y. O diversity, which was a virtual monopoly game based on South Australia about buying, buying land for national parks and saving species. But until we can... That, that, that is how people think. And I can tell you at the moment there are 10 million people in the world, at least, if not 20, playing online games. And then in another four hours, another 10 or 20 million people. And another four hours, another 10 or 20 million people. That's how people engage, not just with computers, but with their friends, because they're playing with each other. Some of these games have a million people simultaneously playing with each other a game. If I was going to try and change people's mind about biodiversity, I would be making those games, because that's the only way you're going to engage some of the modern generation. Marketing. I don't know. I'm not a marketer. I'm an academic. We're probably the worst marketing people on the entire planet, aren't we? We don't, can't, couldn't sell ourselves. Um, so I, I think that requires some innovative thought. Second, what innovative solutions do we need and what thinking do we need from government? I'll just give you a couple of examples of where things are not going well and where a really injection of innovative thought is required. Um, David showed you what's the consequence of climate change for golden bowerbirds, acacias and all these things. We know that species are going to have to move their range, they're going to be in trouble because of climate change, amongst many other things. Uh, what do you do about that? Eight years ago, when we were looking at the National uh, Biodiversity Strategy, I suggested assisted colonisation, that we would actually move species into their potential future ranges. If species are moving south, move them there. If species are missing off the top, going, disappearing off the top of the Australian Alps, move them to Tasmania, because that's the only place you're going to keep them. You do not save species in zoos. I can honestly say, on record, there is no point in investing in zoos. They don't save anything. If they save anything, they save everything for about 50 years, if, if 100 years. You need species in the wild. You need populations of thousands of individuals of any species to persist, and that's basic mathematical ecology. So if you're going to save mountain pygmy possums and a whole heap of 22 endemic plant species on the alpine plateau of Kosciuszko, and that climate looks as though it's going to be unsuitable and you pick up the designs, signs of their decline, you'll have to move them somewhere and you'll probably have to move them to Tasmania. Some of them you may not be able to move anywhere. You may have to move cassowaries to Lamington. Who knows? Or golden bowerbirds to Lamington. When I raised that, the government didn't want to do it. And they refused to discuss it. They won't discuss it in any of their documents because it's too dangerous. Because what do governments not do well? They just don't do anything. 
they're, they're far more frightened of making a mistake, so they just don't take action. And so they're happy to fail by inaction. They won't do anything interesting. So all the innovative solutions are off the table. Different sorts of habitats. We will have to acknowledge that of those hundreds of acacia species, many may have to live in very different places, in very different community types. What was a forest may have to be a grassland. Uh, most of the urban areas of Australia have enormous wetlands and we don't manage them. Most of our conservation, and this is driven often by the NGOs, which are conservative often, is put everything back the way it was. Those times have ended. They're gone. And we don't do any of that. The Europeans, the British, they make grasslands. They make wetlands for a whole host of species that may not have been in those places. Australian conservation doesn't understand that, and that's where we've got to take some action as soon as possible. We are ridiculously conservative, and there is no innovation in the conservation sector because it's all about putting back the way things were in 1750. Well, the way things were in 1750 will never happen again. You've seen the maps. It's toast. Okay. We will have to engineer the world, not conserve the world. And that is not accepted. It's not accepted generally by scientists. It's not accepted by the NGO sector. It's certainly not accepted by government. Their conservation strategies are extremely conservative. A couple of other things. I've probably gone over time already. Where am I going? A minute or two. I've got a minute or two. I'll just talk about a couple of the other things that I think are very, very important. Um, we really need to get government thinking about return on investment. They need to think like business people. A good example, in the last hearing for our country, they spent $2 million trying to stop cane toads getting into Western Australia. You do not stop cane toads. They are unstoppable, and it was a public relations issue. They've just spent a lot of money, and Peter Garrett admitted, said probably it was a mistake, uh, although he sanctioned it, was saving the Christmas Island pipistrelle, which is just another su vague subspecies of another bat, and they're bringing it into captive breeding, and it's incredibly uh, expensive. So we have 1,600, 1,650 listed species in this country, 1,650 species, and the total expenditure on that is $50 million. We've got 1,650 listed species, and we are losing them at a rapid rate. We have to make return on investment decisions. Some species are too expensive to save. Okay, that 1,650 is just a small fraction of all the species that are slowly becoming threatened. And we don't make the hard decisions about where our internal investment is best. We spend too much time probably fighting weeds that can't be fought, fighting cane toads that can't be fought. Prevention is better than cure, and things like overgrazing and poor fire management are preventative activities that stop weeds getting in and stop invasive species getting in. So the thinking of our big public servant agencies are conservative, they lack innovation, and, and they basically don't understand where is the cost-benefit analysis going. And that's where they need to be thinking, that's where they need a lot of help. Um, I'll say one final thing, and that is uh, we are part of Australia, but Australia is really Australasia, and that is the whole region. So our responsibilities in biodiversity extend well beyond our borders. Australia is the second most biodiverse country in the entire planet. The first one is Indonesia, just to our north. We are the two great biodiverse countries in the world. And if you really want to get bang for your buck trying to stop deforestation north of here in any of those countries is certainly the most, the cheapest and the most cost effective way of saving biodiversity and there's a lot of people working on that. The Australian government have put in a small amount of money, I think $250 million, but clearly inadequate attempts to stop deforestation. Fortunately, climate change has given us an excuse to stop deforestation, so that's wonderful, and that climate change bandwagon can help biodiversity a lot if we do it wisely. Thanks a lot.